training and uh, this is my first online Bible study so this is a little different for me uh, more nervous about talking to the camera than I was a bunch of people <laughs> but the guy's with us and he'll he'll work this out and uh, he has plans for it so and I feel honest about that that uh, he has purpose behind it for those that are going to watch and uh, one of the first things I want you to do is we're going to be looking in the book of Judges and we're going to be at chapter 6 verses 1 through 24. So what I'd like for you to do is to kind of help you catch up and follow along a little bit better is take and pause this for now and go ahead and read uh, Judges 6 uh, verses 1 through 24 and it'll kind of help you get a basics of what we're going to go because well, this is a little different I can't really read all the scriptures and do this in a timely fashion because uh, sometimes my Bible studies get long and I'm going to try and make it where you don't fall asleep but you can always pause it and come back to it the next day so I'll go ahead now and uh, open up with a word of prayer Heavenly Father we just thank you once again for this wonderful and blessed day and Father, for the opportunity to still serve a mighty God. And Father, in these times, we ask that your hand be with us, Lord, guiding and directing us in all of our ways, and helping us, Father, as we sit, Father, and, and have extra time possibly now, Father, that we can spend a little more time with you, and that you can use us, Father, not to just sit around and, and think about our, our needs, but, Father, the, the needs of others, and things that we could do to glorify your name. And now I ask that your name be glorified through this lesson and all that's done, that I'm hidden, O Lord God, but your word will stand forth and bring forth Father, prophet unto you and glory unto thy name. And I thank you and I praise you in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. So what we're going to look at, if you've done read that, I hope you have, uh, kind of help you follow along. We're going to be looking at how God works in dark times and we're going to be using that I'll say once again Judges chapter 6 verses 1 through 24 so you know in, if you've been keeping up with the news you know it's not difficult especially at these times where a lot of people are at home now because of the situation that's going on and you know we're kind of told to do that you know with the social distancing and so forth but you know, every day brings stories of, of, of human suffering and you know, of, of war, terrorism, natural disasters, uh, the coronavirus, uh, or crime. In addition, you know, you get daily things that come in that talking about uh, attacking the Christians' uh, faith from every angle imaginable. Uh, you know, even just suing the churches now. Uh, even the news about Christianity reports many stories of. Uh, Christian leaders and churches just falling into sin or defecting actually from the faith, you know, getting caught up in worldly things, uh, trying to uh, get more members by, you know, providing things that people just enjoy more than trying to preach the true word of God. We live in spiritually dark times, and, you know, that can lead us to despair. The book of Judges sketches uh, one of the darkest spiritual times in Israel's history. Joshua had led the people out of the wilderness into the promised land and under his leadership Israel had conquered much of the land which God had promised to Abraham Isaac and Jacob and Moses but after Joshua's death we read in Judges chapter 2 verses 10 through 13 that all generations also would gather to their fathers and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. So you see a generation had risen up that didn't practice believing in, in the God that had delivered them even from Egypt and so they had forgot about God and that can happen if we don't tell our children and raise them up too. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baals and they forsook the Lord the God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods from among the gods of the people who are around them. They bowed themselves down to them, actually, and thus they provoked the Lord to anger. Our God is a jealous God. So they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. 
So, you know, when you get away from uh, God, you know, we kind of get caught up in the things of the world, and that's what happened to them here at this time. Uh, they got into serving the, the gods of the people that were around them. So those verses describe the bleak condition of Israel 11 or 12 centuries actually before Christ. But they also can apply directly to us today. If you grew up in a Christian home, uh, it's a great blessing. But there is also an inherited danger. Your parents knew the Lord and experienced the power of God in their lives. But the question is, do you know the Lord yourself? Have you experienced the power of the gospel in, in your life? If you're only a cultural Christian without a personal knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are susceptible to follow things of the world, uh, idols, uh, make things idols, uh, of a godless culture, even as Israel was doing in Gideon's day. But the encouraging message of the book of Judges is that God is at work even in the darkest of times and even in the weakest, uh, with the weakest, so most mixed up people uh, to accomplish his sovereign purpose for his glory. Uh, Gideon never would have done what he did if God had not taken the initiative. And so Gideon is not really the hero of this story. God is the hero. But God chooses to work through some weak people whom he teaches to trust him. As Paul put it in 2 Corinthians, you need to write some of these scriptures down. I'll give you extra ones where we were jumping around a little bit. And you can go back and look them up, but I'll, some of them I'll be giving you a gist of them. But as Paul put it in 2 Corinthians 4 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. In this message, we'll be looking at Gideon's calling in, in the Judges uh, chapter 6. In the next a couple more lessons we may follow up with this is also about Gideon, uh, looking at Gideon's condition and, and his compromising. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about Gideon and his calling. Because God is at work even in our spiritual darkest times, we can trust him to use us even in our weakest to accomplish his sovereign purpose. So point one is God is at work even in the spiritual darkness times. When you look around at the depressing news, it may seem that God has gone on vacation, but he never does. As Paul states in Ephesians 1, verse 11, uh, we have been predestined according to his purpose to work all things after the counsel of his will. This was true in Gideon's day as well. The book of Judges contains at least six cycles Israel falls into sin, and because of the sin, God brings an enemy that forces them into servitude. Eventually, when the suffering seems overwhelming, Israel cries out to God in supplication. In response, God sends a judge who leads them to salvation. The judges were not like modern courtroom judges, but rather they were leaders who provided military deliverance from Israel's enemies and political oversight in limited geographical regions of Israel. So like most of us, as they were then, we seem to try and do it all ourselves until the last minute. The thing we sh should have done first, we do last. That's what they've done, to call on God. So that might be a something for somebody that needs it today. Don't wait to it gets bad. Start calling on God now. He's there. He's never left us. The fact that God was willing to repeat the deliverance of his idolatrous people over and over shows his great patience and grace. But the harsh servitude that he brought on his sinning people teaches us that sin delivers does not never deliver on its promise. It promises happiness and prosperity and pleasure, but in the end it brings enslavement and suffering to nations, families, and individuals. The theme of Judges is 21 and 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And I think you can look around and see that uh, we see a lot of that now. Uh, here's some additional verses you can go look at. Uh, Judges 17, 6, 
18, 1, and 19, 1. Many of the judges were flawed men who showed that Israel needed a godly leader who would unify the nation for the worship of Yahweh. And Yahweh is just another name for God. In the storyline of the Bible, Judges follows the conquest of the land under Joshua and proceeds the short story of Ruth, which shows how a Moabite woman trusted the God of Israel and was adopted into his covenant people. The punchline at the end of Ruth, which is chapter 4, 17 through 22, tells us that she became the great-grandmother of King David. And then in 1 Samuel, tells us how Israel finally got a king, his first king, uh, the unfaithful King Saul, and then David, King David, uh, the faithful king after God's heart, who descendant would be Jesus the Messiah. So see, God did not, didn't use perfect people to accomplish all of his purpose. Most of them had stuff, <laughs> like most of us. So in Gideon's day, Israel was being overrun by Midianites, nomadic people, um, nomadic people who lived in the southeast of Israel. They were descendants of Abraham and his concubine Keturah. That's in Genesis 25, 1 through 2. During Israel's time in the wilderness, the Midianites had joined with the Moabites uh, under the council of Balaam to seduce Israel into immorality and adultery. And you can refer to that also in Numbers 25, 1 through 9. As a result, God had told Moses to strike the Midianites in war. And that's also in Numbers 25. You go on to verses 16 through 18. So see, you've got homework to do here is go back and look up these verses because I couldn't spend the time it would take for us to actually read all of these. So that's you do some homework and do some real study but, and have some personal time with God. So in Gideon's day, Midian would stay east of the river Jordan until harvest time. Then, with the Amalekites, it was another enemy of Israel, uh, they would swarm into Israel like a locust, you know, and devour their crops. As soon as their crops were about time to be harvested, they would hear they would come. So, it was hard on them. They would steal their farm animals. Uh, you can look in Judges 6, 4 through 5, it talks about that. The Israelites did not have the military strength to fight off those uh, hordes of, of people invading them there. So they had to hide out in dens and caves in the mountains when they came and watch helplessly as the crops they had worked for to harvest were consumed by the foreign raiders. This gone on for, for seven years. The people were brought very low and finally cried out to the Lord in Judges chapter 6 verse 1 and 6 and 7. So you see once again the people had done the thing they should have done first, last. So that's something I don't know if today I think we can glean from that too. We don't have to wait to call on God. He's always waiting for us. So before God raised up Gideon as a military deliverer, he sent an unnamed prophet to confront Israel with their apostasy or their sin. And after rehearsing God's deliverance of Israel from slavery in Egypt, the prophet reminded them of the Lord's command not to fear the God of the Amorites in whose land that they actually live. Then the Lord pointedly, in Judges 16, the second half of the verse, but you have not obeyed me. Next we see the Lord at work when he showed up in Gideon's village of Ophrah as the angel of the Lord, but not an angel, but the angel which some scholars dispute that the angel of the Lord was God himself. So I think the scripture shows that he was the Lord Jesus Christ in precarnate form. Uh, he had the appearance of a man, but after he touched Gideon, meal offering with his staff, causing it to be consumed with fire from the rock, he then disappeared. At that point, uh, Gideon thought that he would die because he had seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And uh, that was the normal thing that was known, that no man looked upon the face of God. So in Judges 6.22, later Samson's father, Manoah, feared the same fate after he and his wife saw the same angel. 
Manoah calls the angel of the Lord God. So, you know, and, and angel also means messenger. So, you know, we know Jesus was a messenger for us too. Uh, and these were messengers and angels. So it was buried more than likely Jesus in a precarnate condition. So in Judges 13, 21 and 22 is where that's noted. So even though Gideon lived in dark times politically and spiritually, God was at work. He was at work in disciplining his wayward people. He was at, at work to raise up a prophet to confront the people with their sin. He was at work to show up bodily in Gideon town, Gideon's town and then to call Gideon to deliver his people. You know how matter dark times and are, and even if you can't see how the Lord is working, you can be sure that he is working to accomplish his sovereign purpose for his glory. How does he do? How does he do it? Point two, God uses weak people to accomplish his sovereign purpose. You always thought he picked out the best, didn't you? He don't. <laughs> You're looking at one. God didn't look for a man with renowned military skills who was already a recognized leader in the community and nation. Rather, he picked a weak man who remained somewhat weak through the, the whole story and who, at the end of the story, finally he failed. Uh, we see Gideon's weakness in our text in at least five ways. Let's look at the first one. First, Gideon was defeated and cowardly, actually. He was threshing wheat in a wine press. You know, that's deep, and so he got down in the wine press threshing the wheat so nobody could see him, especially, you know, the Amalekites and the Midianites. Because if they saw him, they would just basically got done and then go where and get it. Normally, farmers would thresh wheat to separate the wheat from the chaff by using oxen to pull a heavy uh, threshing sledge over it, sled uh, in an exposed area where the wind would just blow away the chaff. Uh, but Gideon was down in the wine press beating the wheat with a stick in order to save it from the Midianites, you know, just trying to hide. That's Judges 6 11. Second, Gideon was dense spiritually. He either had not heard or not understood the message of the prophet, who attributed Israel's abysmal situation to their sin. Gideon rehearsed for the angel how the Lord had delivered Israel from Egypt through mighty miracles, but he mistakenly concluded in Judges 6.13, but now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of the Midian. He was right about the Lord giving Israel into the hand of Midian, but he was wrong in saying that the Lord had abandoned them. As we've seen the Lord was working even in this spiritually dark time. Third Gideon was depressed. Uh, we see this in his complaint that God had abandoned Israel. So Gideon had lost hope for deliverance from this oppressive enemy that was literally eating Israel's lunch. And fourth, Gideon was down on himself rather than being focused on the Lord. And when the angels tell Gideon in Judges 6.14, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. He was not implying that Gideon had the strength in himself to deliver Israel uh, from the Midianites. Rather, Gideon's strength was to be found in the angel's rhetorical question, Have I not sent you? And in the angel's promise in Judges 6.16, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat Midian as one man. And if you're going to trust the Lord, you've got to trust the Lord in what he says, don't you? But he was human there. And he was had all these issues that we're talking about. But Gideon was focused on his own incompetence. And sometimes we can't get ourselves out of the way. Rather than on the Lord's power and presence. In verse 15, Gideon tells the angel, note the repeated I and my. So he's more thinking about me, you know, <laughs> like that. O oh Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least of Manasseh. And I am the youngest in my, in my father's house. So you can see he's self-centered in that thought. Fifth, Gideon was doubtful of God's promises. Doubting God. The angel promised to be with Gideon and that Gideon would defeat the enemy. But Gideon needed a sign to confirm the angel's word. How times we ask the Lord for a sign too. 
not trusting in him and what he's told us in his word. So Gideon needed a sign of the angel's word. God graciously, though, complied with his weak servant's request. First by uh, incinerating Gideon's offering when he brought him the food, and then by making Gideon's fleece, if you read the story, Gideon's fleece first wet and then dry. Uh, knowing Gideon remaining doubts about the attacking the Midianites, God graciously provided a final signal by allowing Gideon to overhear an enemy soldier, telling about a dream in which Gideon was victorious over the Midianite army. Judges 7, 9 through 14. But up to that point, Gideon was marked by doubts. Perhaps you can relate to one or more of these forms of weakness, especially now the times that we're sitting in right now. Maybe you're defeated by some sin that robs you of the fullness of God's blessing in your life. Or you're spiritually dense. Uh, you didn't, you don't see how God can possibly be at work in your dark situation. Uh, maybe you're depressed because of your circumstances. Uh, you've lost hope for any kind of deliverance. Or perhaps you're, you're focused on yourself, you know, the I and my, rather than the Lord. You feel as if you're too weak and insignificant for God to use you. Uh, and maybe you're doubtful of God's promises to be with you and to give you victory over the enemy. In other words, you're and me, we're a lot like Gideon, aren't we? What's the solution? It's not, as the world tells us, to believe in yourself. It's not to build your self-esteem or to follow some best-selling offers uh, steps to success. Rather, as as uh, C. H. McIntosh wrote, if we can do nothing, self-confidence is the height of presumption. If God can do everything, despondency is the height of folly. Or as the Apostle Paul wrote in Second Corinthians chapter one, verses eight through nine. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond their strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Trusting in God is a solution for weak people who want to see Him work in your dark situations. Point three, the weak people God uses must learn to trust His mighty strength. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1, 26-29, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. So that no man may boast before God. There's nothing that we can boast of ourselves. It's all God. Paul also told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12, chapter 12, verses 9 through 10. And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast in my weakness, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with the weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And besides Paul, throughout Scripture, uh, we see God using uh, weak people who trust in Him. Abraham and Sarah were bearing, and beyond their ability to, to, to bear children, when God promised Abraham that he would be a father of many nations. Jacob had to trust God to protect him from his stronger brother Esau. Moses had to spend 40 years in the wilderness tending sheep to break him of his self-confidence. And when the Lord then called him to deliver Israel, 
Moses complained that he was unable to speak well. He asked God to find someone else. Peter fell terribly by denying the Lord before the Lord used him to bring 3,000 to faith on the day of Pentecost. But trusting God can be sort of nubulous. Our text reveals five requirements of trusting God that helps bring in it into more of a focus. First thing is trusting God requires repenting of compromise with the world. The prophet whom God sent confronted Israel's idolatry. That was the main thing they were doing. It displeased God. They were bowing down to these idols in Judges 6.10. But their crying out to God for help was not the same as repentance. You know, you have to turn from those sins. As we'll see in Judges 6, 25-32, Gideon had to begin at home by tearing down his father's idols before God could use him to rout the Midianites. And at the heart of the idolatry is using spiritual power for your own advantage. In this sense, many professing Christians try to use God for personal success or to gain whatever blessing they're looking for and if he comes through, they thank him and put him back on the shelf until the next time they need him. If he doesn't come through, they just look for another God uh, who can deliver the goods. Uh, but trusting God means repenting of trying to use him for your own agenda and submitting to Jesus as Lord, even if it means suffering, even to martyrdom. Second, trusting God requires knowing his power on behalf of, of his people in the past and his promise of power for what he calls us to do. Believing in God's word. The prophet rehearsed the familiar story of how God had delivered Israel from Egypt. Gideon knew that story, but he didn't yet see how God would work in the current gloomy situation. The angel promised that he would defeat Midian as one man in Judges 6.16 which either meant all at once or as easily as one man could be defeated, repeatedly in the scripture reminds his servants, God reminds his servants, that nothing is too difficult for him to do. And I want to just hit a few verses here and show you too. I can hit these are short verses. In Genesis eighteen fourteen, it says, Is anything impossible for the Lord? I will return to you when the season comes round again, and Sarah will have his son. And this was he talking about Abraham as he promised him to be the father of many nations. In Jeremiah 32, uh, 27, once again he says, I am the Lord, the God of all humankind. There is indeed nothing too difficult for me. In Matthew nineteen twenty six, Jesus looked at them and replied, This is impossible for mere humans. But for God, all things are possible. And one more in Luke chapter 1, verses 37. Plain and simply says, For nothing will be impossible with God. Point three is, Trusting God requires knowing God's purpose for the future. I'm not talking about knowing all the details of how He will direct your future. Rather, I'm talking about knowing in some way how God wants to use you in his kingdom purposes. Uh, the angel first told Gideon in Judges 6.12, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. You know, this was when Gideon was, was a mess, but he called him a valiant warrior. Gideon probably looked around to see if he was talking to someone else. At that point, Gideon wasn't a valiant warrior. He was a defeated coward threshing out wheat in a wine press, but God calls his servant by what he will make them, not by what they are when he first calls them. Jesus called fickle Peter actually a rock and promised to build his church on Peter's confession. That's in Matthew 16, uh, verses 16 through 18. And Paul called the carnal Corinthians saints or holy ones, even though at that point they were far from holy. Uh, you can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. In Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verse 3, he sets forth our 
glorious position in Christ before he exhorts us. In Ephesians 4, 6, how to walk in the light of that position, he tells us, here is who you are in Christ. Now live that way. Are we living the way we are to be as Christians, as children of the Most Holy God, as children of Christ? The angel specifically told Gideon that he was sending him to defeat the Midianites. In Judges 6.14 You might wish that God had spoken directly to you uh, like that to clarify what he wants you to do. But in general terms, he says to us in 1 Peter 4.10 As each one has received a gift, a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If you don't know what your gift is, start serving somewhere and the Lord will direct and refine you in the process. Your gift will be something you enjoy doing, not that it's always easy, uh, and it ministers to others. That's another sign of a, doing God's purpose. Fourth, trusting God requires knowing His presence in your daily life. Uh, twice Judges 6 verses 12 and 16 the angel of the Lord promised Gideon that he would be with him if God is with us and he is for us then who can stand against us and if you look in Romans chapter 8 verse 31 you'll see this very scripture both David Livingston and the intrepid missionary of the interior of Africa and John Patton who lived among the cannibals of the new Herbrides Islands uh, don't know if I pronounced that right. Uh, relied heavily on Jesus' promise in the Great Commission, in, which is in Matthew 28, 20. He said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's the promise of God. Livingston said, On these words I stake everything, and they never failed. Patton buried his wife, and a short time later he buried his infant son. Not long after they had arrived in the South Seas, he said that in danger and in grief he was sustained by Jesus' promise, though I am with you always. Uh, today the new Herbrides, now known as the Vanuti, is one-third Presbyterian, making it the most Presbyterian country in the world. So there was a mighty work of God that had to be fulfilled. Fifth, trusting God requires knowing that we are at peace with Him through the sacrifice of His Son for us. It's not clear what Gideon intended by bringing the food offering to the angel. Perhaps at first he viewed it as a hospitality gesture, but when the angel touched the food it was burned up, and then the angel disappeared. Gideon was afraid that he would die because he had seen the Lord. But the Lord told him in Judges 6.23, Peace to you, do not fear, you shall not die. Then we read in Judges 6.24, Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and named it, The Lord is Peace. You cannot trust God to use you in serving to Him until you know that you are at peace with Him through trusting in the sacrifice of His Son. Paul wrote in Romans 5, 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If your faith is in Christ and His sacrifice for your sins, if your faith is in Christ and His sacrifice for your sin and mine, then you are at peace with God, even in the darkest of times. He wants you to use you in your weakness as you trust him to help accomplish his sovereign purpose for his glory. In conclusion, our world, our nation, and our community are spiritually dark. Perhaps you're going through a spiritually dark time personally. You can know that God is at work even if you don't immediately see evidence of it. He wants you to trust Him and to use the gifts He has entrusted to you as part of His plan to be glorified through His church. Uh, 
Hudson uh, Taylor, the pioneer missionary to China, said, God uses men, he meant, you know, women too, uh, who are weak and feeble enough to lean on him. That's how God works in spiritually dark times. So trusting in Christ and what he's done for us. Have you turned to Christ too? Have you asked him to come into your life, into your heart, and save you from the world and from the sin of the world and the sin that's in your life? And be willing to turn from those sins and trust God and serve him for the gift of eternal life. Now's the time to call out to him. And then get to know him as we've looked in this lesson how that he will be with us and use us even though we're the weakest or think we're nothing God will consider you and who you are and through his strength and his power we can do all things according to his purpose I thank you and I hope you'll use this lesson and go back over it and go back over some of the scriptures some of these can be important verses that we can use in our everyday life to help keep us strengthened as we go in our walk especially to, through these times of troubles uh, don't know where God's leading everything but uh, I think he's got special purpose to come out of this time when it's over and uh, he wants those that are called by his name to be ready uh, because there's people we need to minister to and those of you that maybe haven't received him yet uh, it's time that we do that because the Bible says today is the day of salvation and I hope you understand and God will use you and move with the spirit upon your life and your heart to come in and show you the truth and the life. Thank you once again. Uh, we'll see how these things go. Uh, about doing these Bible studies online, they're a little different. <laughs> uh, not having input, <laughs> but um, and the questions. You know, we do a little discussion you now here at the church when we normally done it. So it's it's a uh, kind of get together like a one on one. But God can use you even with this lesson if you'll put time into the Word and looking into it yourself he'll be with you and he'll show you things maybe you haven't even heard from here and, and uh, but you can still use and uh, i thank you today and i'm going into prayer almighty god we just call upon your holy and righteous name giving you all the praise and honor and glory now father you set your word for us to accomplish that which you are sending it to do and i'm trusting you O lord god in everything father the will of the lord god be done and to Jesus Christ be the glory forever and ever. And I give you the thanks and the praise today as you bless this ministry to keep going forth, Father. Even in these times, Father, to serve the mighty God of all the earth, who was and is and is to come, I give you the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.